Be sure to follow this ministry on BitChute and Rumble, where you can see extended news coverage with biblical commentary. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is $Watchman1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A new study is revealing there are significant differences between current generations when it comes to spiritual beliefs. And there's one generation in particular that either don't know or don't care if God exists. Trinity Chavez has more on the study. While interest in spirituality has been looming in recent years, interest in religion has been plummeting, especially among millennials. A new study by Arizona Christian University's Cultural Research Center reveals 43% of millennials either don't believe in God, don't care, or don't know if they do. After conducting an American Worldview Inventory, a survey of the philosophy of life on American adults, participants in the study included four generations. Millennials born from 1984 to 2002, Gen X born from 1965 to 1980, baby boomers from 1946 to 1964, and builders from 1927 to 1945. They found 90% of builders believe that you should treat others as you want them to treat you, while less than half of millennials agree. 66% of millennials are willing to try anything at least once, compared to the 28% of builders. 43% of millennials stated they either don't know, don't care, or don't believe God exists, compared to the 28% of boomers, and nearly half of all boomers believe that when they die, they will go to heaven only because they confessed their sins and accepted Jesus as their savior, compared to the only 26% of Gen X and 16% of millennials. But despite the differences, the data shows that there are key similarities among all generations. And regardless of their generation, a majority of Americans call themselves Christian, ranging from about 57% of millennials to 83% of builders. Still though, the researchers say the beliefs and behaviors of younger Americans, especially millennials, threaten to reshape the nation's religious parameters beyond recognition. Hosea 4.6 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. In the last days, just prior to Jesus' return, the Bible tells us there will be a falling away from the Christian faith, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, speaking of the rapture, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ, speaking of the tribulation, had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, the tribulation will not come unless the falling away, the apostasy, comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who is the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-4 tells us, First the rapture will take place, then after the rapture comes the seven-year tribulation and that the falling away from the Christian faith and the revealing of the Antichrist will take place before the tribulation begins. Clearly, the Antichrist has not yet taken his place on the world scene, but we are most definitely seeing the falling away from the Christian faith, which leads up to the next question. How close are we to the rapture of the church? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month, or he might come next week, or he could even come...
Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. Luke 21.11 and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. A powerful earthquake struck southern Qinghai province in China early on Saturday, causing what experts say will be significant economic loss. The 7.3 quake took place around a thousand kilometers north of an earlier tremor on Friday night in southwestern China near Myanmar that caused at least three deaths and 27 injuries, according to officials. U.S. geophysicists said the two quakes were not related. The latest took place in a mainly rural region and so far there have been no reports of any casualties. Aftershocks continued into Saturday morning, with multiple smaller tremors recorded by China's earthquake administration. The country's worst quake was in the mountainous western portion of Sichuan province in 2008, when almost 90,000 people died. We turn now to Central Africa, where a devastating volcanic eruption has killed at least 15 people. Lava flowed into villages in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, formerly known as Zaire. Thousands of frantic people fled to safety across the border into Rwanda. UNICEF says more than 170 children are feared missing. As Zebra Pata reports, a major city was spared from the destruction, but other parts of the country were not so lucky. As the nighttime sky turned a fiery red, panic spread across Goma. I remember we saw the same signs before, said resident John Kilosho. We don't know what to do. There's no information. Just six miles away, Mount Nyiragongo had erupted again, spewing rivers of hot lava that snaked their way towards the lakeside city, home to at least two million people. Those who remembered the last eruption of 2002 were terrified the deadly tragedies would be repeated. That disaster left 250 people dead and 120,000 homeless. In the absence of official communication, nobody waited around to see what would happen this time. And so they fled, heading for higher ground or the nearby Rwandan border. The insistent ring of cell phones piercing the air as frantic families checked in on loved ones. By morning, the devastation was clear. Homes had been engulfed by flames, entire villages razed to the ground. I curse this day, sobbed 68-year-old Ernestine Kabur as she stumbled through the smoldering rubble. Her husband had been burnt to death in their home. He was too sick to run, she too frail to carry him. Aid workers are still assessing the damage. It could take months to rebuild shattered communities. For now, panic has given way to morbid curiosity as people who escaped the worst of it took selfies amidst the still glowing molten ash. The last eruption saw the lava flow through the city for over a day, but this time, Goma was spared. I've been to Goma several times and have a pretty good idea of where that lava was actually headed. And I can tell you that it's nothing short of remarkable that it stopped just before the city limits. The immediate danger has receded, but residents tell us that they are still experiencing frightening tremors. There has been a dramatic increase in volcanic eruptions around the world, and nobody knows why. You probably haven't noticed because nobody seems to be talking about it. But something is going on with the world. Volcanoes are erupting at a faster pace than ever. And earthquakes are going crazy. And nobody has an explanation for it. Nobody except God, that is. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world and the news headlines prove it. 
God in his grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day's signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation seems to include a massive volcanic eruption, as we read in Revelation 8.8. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Tonight, more storms churning in the Gulf of Mexico, threatening parts of Texas and Louisiana, trying to dry out after an historic week of heavy rain and flash floods. Near Baton Rouge, a dam failed Friday, forcing hundreds to evacuate as emergency responders moved in. The wet weather also filling streets and homes with water in central Arkansas. The damage piling up each day. You're fighting a losing battle that no matter what you do, the wa water is unforgiving. They call it the most destructive natural force for a reason. Mother Nature is unleashing another blow in the Atlantic with strong winds, high surf and heavy rain near Bermuda. Forming overnight, Anna is now the first named storm of the hurricane season. We've had seven years in a row of a tropical storm or a subtropical storms forming before the beginning of hurricane season. The busy part of the hurricane season is August 15 to October 15. And the Northeast will be feeling more like summer in May. D.C., Philly, and New York expected to climb into the 90s. It's too hot because I can barely breathe with my mask on. It shouldn't be this hot right now, but... A little worry know. about climate change. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, all these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat and they blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. The Russian president has warned that those who attack the country will have their teeth knocked out. Vladimir Putin was speaking at a government meeting when he made the comment, saying Russia's enemies were looking to clip its wings every time the nation grew stronger. He didn't name the country's adversaries explicitly, but it comes at a time of difficult relations with the West. Everyone wants to bite us somewhere or to bite off something from us, but they those who are going to do it should know that we will knock their teeth out so that they can't bite. It's obvious. And the key to this is the development of our armed forces. In the last days, the Bible tells us that Jerusalem will be a cup of drunkenness to the surrounding nations as we read in Zechariah 12.2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. The idea of a cup of drunkenness is to cause the neighboring nations to reel to go mad and to lose the capacity for sound reasoning, leading those nations to judgment. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, now entering its third day, is holding, with both sides assessing the damages and adjusting in the aftermath of the 11 days of intense fighting, which saw rocket barrages on Israeli civilians around the clock and retaliatory strikes on the Gaza Strip. Let's take a look.
Operation Guardian of the Walls came to an end Friday at 2 a.m. through an Egyptian brokered ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. The operation saw 11 days of unprecedented rocket barrages on Israel's southern border and missiles being fired on major Israeli cities, including Tel Aviv. The IDF announced over the course of the fighting, over 4,360 rockets were fired at Israel, with 680 misfiring back into Gaza. The Iron Dome intercepting about 90% of the rockets fired, but still, 13 people were killed in Israel as a result of the attacks, including a six-year-old boy and three foreign workers. Additionally, the IDF said it struck over 1,500 terror targets in the Gaza Strip in targeted airstrikes, damaging 675 rocket launching capabilities, neutralizing over 200 terrorists, many senior Hamas officials, and destroying over 60 miles of Hamas terror tunnels. The Gaza Health Ministry reporting that 248 people were killed in Gaza during the conflict. Despite the losses, both sides are claiming victory. Meanwhile, on Sunday, the Temple Mount opened to Jews for the first time in weeks, following tensions and unrest which led to clashes between Arabs and Israeli police. And throughout Israel, cities with mixed Jewish and Arab populations like Jaffa, Lod, Akko and Beersheba attempting to get back to normal after the unprecedented violence and riots that took place over the course of the Gaza conflict, which saw synagogues burned down and the lynching of both Jews and Arabs alike. Additionally, Israeli police chief Kobi Shabtai telling top officers that the Jewish Arab violence could still erupt in the coming days. According to Israeli Channel 12 News, Shabtai said the end of the military campaign does not mean the campaign within Israel is over, saying that deployment of police forces throughout the country will continue for now. And so, while the conflict with Gaza has ended and both sides now recovering from the aftermath, Israelis and Palestinians are trying to resume their daily lives as the trauma of the past 11 days remains. The organizers had predicted 150,000 might attend. In reality, it seemed even more. London's Piccadilly filled with people as far as the eye could see, a march literally more than a mile long. A week ago, the same campaign groups had marched on the Israeli embassy, demanding an end to missile attacks on Gaza. Friday's ceasefire seemed to have energized these same activists. This demonstration is to make sure that we get more than a ceasefire out of this, that we get a real movement in the uh, attitude of the great powers and of the Israeli government towards the Palestinians, that we move towards a just settlement for the Palestinians. That sentiment is shared by activists across Europe. Demonstrators also massed in Bulgaria and the German capital, Berlin. In Paris, hundreds of demonstrators gathered in Place de la Republic to unfurl an enormous Palestinian flag. Palestinians have been persecuted for the past uh, 73 years and we need to free Palestine no matter whether there's a ceasefire in place or, or not at the moment. Palestine. Comparison has been made with the Black Lives Matter movement and in the UK there is evidence that the perceived injustices of Israel's treatment of Palestinians is provoking a particularly strong response among students and young adults. There is almost a sense of a new generation of pro-Palestinian campaigners emerging. So proud that so many of us yet again have come to make a stand for something this important. Um, a lot of people think that this doesn't do anything. A lot of people think that we're just marching and screaming, but there has been change, and we're just not going to stop until that change has actually come into place and we have a free Palestine. What Israel is doing is wrong. There's no one here calling for violence, nobody calling for hate. We just want peace. It's as simple as that. What's been most striking about this demonstration is not just the sheer weight of numbers on display here, but also the youthfulness of the crowd. They are predominantly in their teens and 20s and early 30s, and they are buoyed by the belief that the pressure that they have brought to bear over the past two weekends has contributed significantly to bringing an end to the conflict in Gaza. But the message they're putting out here is that the conflict may be over, but that the campaign goes on. God gives a dire warning for the nations that come against Jerusalem, as we read in Zechariah 12.3. And it shall happen in that day, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24.12. And because lawlessness will be increased, 
the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. We turn to Southern California now. Police hunting for a suspect in the shocking shooting death of a six-year-old boy. An apparent road rage incident. He was in a booster seat on his way to school. And now the emotional plea from his family. Here's ABC's Zareen Shah. Tonight, the urgent search for the suspect who shot and killed a six-year-old Aiden Laos on a Los Angeles area highway. Aiden's mom driving the kindergartner to school Friday morning on the 55 freeway when authorities say her vehicle came under fire in an apparent road rage incident. Someone pulled out a gun and shot my little brother in the stomach. And he said, Mommy, my, my tummy hurts. So she went and she picked him up and he was bleeding on her. His older sister Alexis, who was not in the car at the time, speaking out on her distraught mother's behalf. He started turning blue, and that's when the ambulance took him, and that was the last time that my mom saw him alive. Officials say the suspect was possibly in a white Volkswagen. According to the family, two people were in that vehicle. Aiden's sister pleading for the public's help. Please? Help us find the people that did this to my little brother. He's only six and he was so sweet. Police say this tragic incident is separate and unrelated to a string of terrifying shootings on Southern California highways. Car windows shattered, motorists terrorized, authorities believe by either BB or pellet guns. Just yesterday, our Los Angeles station KABC reporting at least eight vehicles shot at. According to KABC, there have been at least 80 incidents since late April almost all along the 91 freeway. April Brunig's car struck this morning as she was driving to work. A large gunshot sound bang occurred. I was just glad my kids weren't in the car. Right now, police say they're not sure if there's a single suspect or if there are possible copycats involved. So we're looking at every aspect of every incident, treating each one as an isolated incident, and we're going to look for patterns. That shooting there in Southern California is just one of more than 7,000 gun deaths in the U.S. so far this year. The numbers rising significantly during the pandemic. Janae joins us with more on the increasing violence that we're seeing. Janae, good morning. Hey, wait, good morning. I'm out in Times Square. This was the scene of a shooting just a few weekends ago, an example of a really troubling trend, a stunning surge of gun violence around the country. Look at this, the total number of deaths by gun violence, not including suicide. You can see the moderate rise from 2018 to 2019, but in 2020, nearly 4,000 more Americans died by gun violence, roughly a 25% increase in a single year. And already this year, that number topping 7,500. Obviously, that number is changing constantly. For example, Friday night, 10 people were shot in downtown Minneapolis. And with that alarming increase of gun violence, the impact on innocent children has been devastating. Six-year-old Anaya Allen was riding in her mom's car in Minneapolis when they were caught in an exchange of gunfire. She was one of three children recently shot there. This past week, three children were shot in as many days in the Washington, D.C. metro area. And in Chicago, 108 children have been the victims of shootings this year alone, 16 of them have died. And in the shooting here in Times Square earlier this month, a four-year-old girl was one of three people hit by a stray bullet. They all fortunately survived. But when we hear those staggering figures, you have to remember they are not just numbers. Each one of those are victims. And for those who die, they leave behind family members, like the mother you just heard Zoreen spoke to, grieving family members. So the number of Americans impacted by gun violence is exponential. Eva. And those numbers are really startling to look at this morning. A manhunt underway tonight for the shooter after a celebration in Bridgeton, New Jersey, ended in bloodshed. 1029 East Commerce Street, a gunshot. You can see the aftermath of a night of terror. Flipped over tents and tables, debris scattered everywhere after gunshots sent hundreds of partygoers scrambling for safety. Somebody fired from the woods or came out of the woods and uh, it's very tragic and devastating for our whole community. 14 were wounded, two left dead. It's complete chaos. 
John Fuqua is an advocate who works with young people in the community. Many of his family members were at the party. 15 year olds, 80 year olds were having a good time. It was a 90 things party. Um, it wasn't a shooting gallery. Um, it wasn't a hunting exposition. Um, it was a party. No arrests have been made and New Jersey State Police are still investigating what exactly happened. But some fear this may have been a targeted ambush. This was something set up. They trapped them in that yard. Bridgeton has struggled with increasing crime and poverty rates. Community leaders described last night's mass shooting as a setback. We've had a lot of um, violence in, in our community, a lot of um, fighting, and we're working so hard. That's the saddest thing. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Last night in Times Square, police say a Jewish man was the victim of an alleged hate crime. This video appears to show the moment 29-year-old Joseph Borgen was attacked. Also, I'm surrounded by like a whole mob crowd of people. Uh, they proceeded to, you know, obviously assault me, beat me, kick me, punch me, hit me with crutches. One man is facing multiple charges, including assault as a hate crime. The NYPD says it is looking for as many as six others. Borgen says they yelled anti-Semitic slurs while he was being beaten. You're a dirty Jew, we're going to kill you. The assault took place as pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli protesters confronted each other. In the days following the start of the recent violence in the Middle East, the Anti-Defamation League found more than 17,000 tweets with variations of the phrase, Hitler was right. In a survey, 63% of American Jews have experienced or witnessed anti-Semitism in the last five years and more than half feel less safe. On Tuesday, restaurant goers in Los Angeles were pelted with glass bottles, attacked by people waving Palestinian flags and yelling slurs against Jews. A conflict thousands of miles away, triggering anti-Semitic violence on U.S. streets. We are also learning new details about a shooting at Silver Lake in Snohomish County yesterday. Everett police now say the man who was shot has died from his injuries. And witnesses to the shooting say the man shot had been chasing families with weapons and striking people before a bystander pulled a gun, shooting him twice. This incident happened in broad daylight. We had people out walking the sidewalks, enjoying the park with their families, even fishing here at the lake. That's when police say a man who was walking his dog became aggressive and violent. Hey, I mean, it's kind of unheard of folks running around chasing old women, holding grandbabies with a baton, screaming. Howard Rohde was just one of several people who police say intervened during a scary confrontation at Silver Lake on Tuesday. And he's screaming all these obscenities. And his friend snapped this image of him confronting the man on the right, who police say had become aggressive to people walking along the sidewalk including a woman and her grandchild. Rhodey said he stepped in to try and calm the situation. Even after being struck by the baton and being pepper sprayed by the man, look at the man's right hand. That device, says Rhodey, looked like it could have been a firearm. Police say that's when yet another bystander also stepped in, but that person was armed and ended up shooting the man wearing the green shorts twice. Rhodey says he then rushed in to tend to his wound. He immediately removed his backpack, took his jacket off, tried to remove his shirt and plugged his wound. Why? because that's the right thing to do. The bystander who shot him was detained and interviewed by police, but he wasn't arrested. The case remains an active investigation. Ever police say the man in the green shorts was carrying something that looked like it could have been a firearm, but it wasn't. In fact, it rather could dispense pepper spray. Brody says he tried to calm tensions, but felt he had to protect others, saying it was the right thing to do. I'm really sorry, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't want the guy to die. I tried my best to do what we could until the police and first responders were able to remove him um, to take him to the hospital. I did my best to try to protect him and keep him alive, even after he pepper sprayed me and hit me. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
Whereas in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5 through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised Him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. There is nothing more essential to the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Paul declares what the gospel is and how important it is to embrace it and share it with others. He reminds the Corinthians of the gospel he preached among them, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that Christ is coming back for his church someday in the rapture according to the scriptures, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15:51 through 55 Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Jesus promised his followers he was going to go and prepare a place for them in his Father's house, where there are many mansions as we read in John 14, one through three. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is the essence of the gospel, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for sinners, his resurrection to everlasting life, and his coming back someday is central to our Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. One day Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you 
will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!